Now to the matter of this kind of incendiary letter by uh, Mr. Mello that um, is also very educational. Um, I don't really know what to say here. Uh, each, it, does each commissioner make $35,000 a year? Or do they make $35,000 a year in aggregate? And that is their salary. They don't all make 35000 no. It varies. It, it varies. So it's, it's about thirty-five each. I mean, I'm looking at these comparisons to, uh, to cities of similar size. You've got a city two-thirds the size where people are paid one-tenth the amount. You've got a city the same size where people are paid one-thirty-fifth the amount. You have nowhere where anyone's paid anything close to $10,000. What's going on here? Well, this has been going on for, for years. This is before my time. However, um, these commissioners are full-time. Those commissioners meet um, maybe a few times a year, and they may not have the same duties that these commissioners do. Um, through you, Mr. Vice Chair, I just want to add, it, um, we can certainly get more history here, but this has been going on for a very long time, and I think there was a determination or a reaffirmation, I think, a number of years ago that as a body, the Election Commission are the department heads of the, of the commission. And so there was, um, uh, you know, some salary increases and things that went along with that um, a number of years ago. Um, originally, via state law, the Election Commission ran the Election Commission. The board ran the Election Commission. And then they came along with years later where they revamped part of that by including the executive director to run the office. So, therefore, you have the Board of Election Commissioners, and that's why they're paid a full-time salary. And, and then there's this bit at the end here that talks about how we handle the day of elections and, and when we're ready with our data and stuff. I'm not sure if you've seen the, uh, the write-up. I, I have no insight into how the day of election goes. But if I'm this, sorry, I haven't seen it. I can hand it to you. I, I, the, I can read it. I, I don't want to read it. It's not. Want me to reference it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, it's not a flattering. It's not a flattering account. It basically says we're we're leaving our posts early. It says we're uh, carrying on into the night, well past uh, other cities of similar size. It says that we could just be using our mechanical and digital implements to have ready answers sooner. I I, I don't know what to make of any of that, which is all news to me. Well, I, you know, I, I, can, can I, really I just, if I just wanted to say first, I mean, certainly, um, Ms. Ford or anybody can add to this, but have not, we have not seen the letter. They haven't had the chance to really look at the allegations to really have a, a specific, um, uh, answer to these questions or concerns. I haven't seen it either. Uh, but perhaps in general, if you want to talk about sort of the work schedule or schedule of an election commissioner overall, that perhaps is helpful. And then we can, if you'd like, we can get back to some of the specific ones at a later time. And uh, just if we can tie the questions more directly to the budget, um, but, but obviously there's, the some, there's some leeway because we don't often get departments in front of us, and, and so this is often used as an opportunity to ask other questions, but let's, if, if you can. Yeah, for, from my perspective, I thought everything in the letter was tied to the budget. It's about our expenditures, and it's about how those expenditures are or aren't tied to best practices for election commission work. I think, I don't know any other time when we would discuss things of this gravity. Yeah, I, I guess I would just, the, some of the allegations like in the letter of workers leaving early and those kinds of things, I, I would save that for another no, conversation. And I don't know how true that is. I didn't write the letter, right? My right. point is, is really about pay, work, and accountability, which I think is a budgetary issue. Well, I can only uh, speak to the schedule, the commissioners, and they can also speak to it. Um, on election night, uh, the commissioners are required to come back to the tabulation center. They cannot stay at the polls. There are 34 uh, precincts. There's no way that the commissions can stay at each and every one of those. Right. That's number one. 
Um, number two, they are there to um, make sure that these places are closed up, make sure that the um, absentee ballots have been delivered at the end of the day, and then proceed back to the tabulation center to open a regular meeting for tabulation that night. We then wait for the poll workers to show. So however long the poll workers take is how long we have to wait. They have to process absentee ballots. They have to do some hand counting. This could take hours or it could take a few minutes. We have no way of telling. And again, other cities and towns may not have the same amount of precincts that we have. We do have 34 precincts, and they're stretched out throughout the city. So police officers, the police officers go to each one of these locations. They, the, well, actually, most of them are there already. They bring back the poll worker and the equipment. DPW picks up. Um, and puts away, we can't just send DPW back, you know, home and then tell them to come back again. They have to stay with us all evening, the employees that are there. They help us with the equipment, the packing of the boxes, the, equi um, the election boxes, and then they help us transfer all of that equipment over to um, the vault and the storage facility. So everyone here, I'm not quite sure, you know, I haven't had an opportunity to read this entire um, letter, but... That's about what I can come up with. And it also takes the consultants some time to get all of the information from each and every poll worker, the memory cards from each and every um, uh, election tabulation machine, and then download it and then process that. So it is a process. Plus, here in the city of Cambridge, we have an auditor because we want to make sure that the process is correct. Now, we're not depending on just the tabulators. So we then give the information to our auditor, and he goes through it, and once everything kind of clicks, the commission is approved. So it does take some time. It's not a one, two, three. If I might say, all of the commissioners begin the day prior to the opening of the polls. And we spend the day going from polling location to polling location to polling location, making sure that they have the uh, forms and equipment that they need, making sure those things work. We have very old equipment, and it, it often breaks down, and we will go and, to the extent that we can make repairs, we make repairs. Um, in addition, we're very often called to come to discuss something with a voter who has an issue. And um, we take a small amount of time for lunch and then keep going until the polls close. In the case of a municipal election, we go to each one of our own precincts at, after the close of the day to pick up the memory cards, and we physically carry those back to um, the tabulation center. And in my case, it, it's a fairly large geographical area that crosses Mass Avenue and Fresh Pond Parkway, which is a challenge. <laughs> um, but it's not as if we show up on election day at 8 o'clock at night. Right. We have been going since 6 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we keep on going all day long. And in the case of the presidential, we stayed until 3 o'clock in the morning on the day after the election. So until the last precinct is there and then the auditor has a chance to verify the numbers, do we vote then to um, certify, and it, it, I understand that there are sometimes complaints that we don't get the figures out, um, but those are, are always unofficial. We do provide Associated Press with figures from selected precincts as early as we can, but we certainly can't provide figures for the whole city until the whole city is reported. That all, that all made sense to me. I think, I think the one thing the letter does do is says that you work 14-hour days. What it didn't say is that you sometimes work 24-hour days on those election days, which is very, very impressive, very impressive. Yeah, right. And if you don't mind, I, have, I see here it mentioned something about the, the police detail. We require police at each and every one of those locations. And in addition, in the last few years, due to security at schools across the country, We've made sure that there is additional uh, an additional police officer each, each and every school. So there's two police officers. They're not really racking up overtime. They're there to do a job. Yeah, that that, that part. Um, 
I guess I wasn't as concerned about, but I was just, I'm trying to figure out I, all of this to, to, for me to understand kind of how much do election commissioners work for the full-time salary. So what I'm understanding is that there's a couple times a year the folks are working not just a lot of hours, but very long days, 22-hour days, maybe 10 of them on overtime. It could substantiate a lot of this 35K salary. <clears throat> but on the whole, I'm wondering, does the number of hours per year reach up you know, two and past 100 hours per commissioner or, or 500 hours? or I, I really wouldn't be able to answer that. I could answer uh, based on last year. Oh, yes, sure. Absolutely. That and more. Uh, Just the early voting think? alone, the hours there. Uh, uh, so I'm sorry to keep the, interrupting. The, ma the manager had a, a oh, point. Of course. No. I, I just want to say that, you know, I've been involved in interviews as the finance director and recently a city manager. And I think there is care guidelines that we expect from our election commissioners. I work closely with Tonya. And I think in terms of carrying out the duties that are described by the state law and by the city, our election commissioners are doing what they've asked to be, to be done. And I think there are, it is an hours that some days is a lot more, some days is a lot less. But I think it's difficult to address issues like this on the floor without actually even seeing ahead of time what the concerns are. I believe that if you look at our elections, they're being run properly. Are they being done under the rules and regulations they're supposed to be? I think obviously the election department has a lot to do with it, but I have talked to these commissioners. I know how much respect they have for the role they play. I have been in interviews with them. I know how seriously they take their job. And I just think it's $35,000. It's not your traditional hour by hour, and I can understand that. Nobody is more conscious of making sure that where our tax dollars go is an appropriate number for the residents of the city than I am. But I think based on what they do, this is somewhat of a unique position. It's not an hourly position. It's not an hourly rate. But I think in terms of carrying out the duties that they've been asked to do, from what I can see, we are well representative of what we have. And I don't think they should necessarily be a victim, I guess, of a procedure that says this is the salary, this is the demands, as long as they're making it in doing what the demands are that we've placed on them. And if we need to see if there's areas that we can place more demands on them, I am not opposed to that. But I do want to say from my short period here as city manager, but as finance director, any meeting that I've been at with the election commission is they take their job very seriously. They take their job in terms of their hiring process. I mean, we've had a lot of discussion about how they make sure that the people that they have in the polls understand the importance of when people come in, how we're respectful of them, how we've trained them to handle situations, how to be positive with people and making sure that people vote. So again, I can't say what they're doing hour by hour, but I can say in meetings with them, they take their job very seriously, they have responsibility, they follow the guidelines that we've asked of them, and I don't know what more we can do, but I will be happy to look further into, you know, what roles and hours that, this, that we can look into this, but I think I just want to say that I want to be a little fair to my dealings with the commissioners. They've, they've really try to do everything we've asked of them. Now, should we be asking for more? <laughs> That's a different question, but they've been very responsible to the city from all sides that I've been able to see. And I think, I'm sorry I missed the start of this. I had to do something, but I just felt I had to just say that. Thank you. And, and, uh, I don't want this to be misconstrued as some kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, a thing about personalities. I really like the commissioners I know. The ones I don't know seem very diligent. The work is obviously very grueling work. I mean, whether you think it's 14 hours or 22 hours, that's uh, either way. It's a lot of work. Um, my concern is just about setting an a – there's one more point after this point about dollars and accountability. But the, 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 the main thing – um, is to set an objective standard in people's minds uh, around which we can understand what the work entails and how it should be compensated. Um, you know, I can come over here and look at a department head making $155,000. I can assume that they're working full-time or full-time plus, and so they're making not more than $75 an hour. 
If I were to take the numbers we just talked about for the election commission, they may be making $300 an hour if they're working, you know, 100 hours a year, or, or if they're working 200 hours a year, then they're making 175. Pardon me? No? I, it, or I, I don't understand. Uh, maybe Paid on a weekly basis? I understand how they're... How they're so it's 20 okay. hours a week. I see. And so people are doing election commission work as commissioners 20 hours a week. They, like, clock in and clock out. And wh what do they do? But so, I, I understand election day. Maybe I'm not understanding the role or, like, not understanding the department. Yeah, maybe. Can you help enlighten me? What do election commissioners meetings. do again? They certify signatures. Um, they're the registrars also. They, they hire the poll workers. Um, they don't have to necessarily be inside the office to work. They uh, check addresses for our department, addresses that we have incorrect um, and we provide them with and they report back to us. Um, there are several things that they have, they're responsible for doing, but they don't necessarily do it in the office. As the newest commissioner, I will point out that the thing that struck me is we have for every election between 80 and 96 employees each. A big part of the job is making sure not only are they trained, but you're keeping up with them, you're checking in with them, you're making sure that they feel valued, you get them assistance in what they need. It involves reaching out to them a couple of times a month just to catch up with them because you don't want your employees not to show up at the next election because you're looking at one person can throw that entire um, precinct off. So that's a big amount of work to make sure that your employees, both current and recruiting for new ones, because unfortunately a lot of our poll workers either move out of the city, move out of the state, or in too many cases recently they pass away. And that means you're looking for additional poll workers that, as you know, hiring people is not easy. Hiring someone for one day out of the year can be really difficult. So you need to make sure you're bringing that into the equation as well. And that's a substantial amount of team building, outreach, and follow-up. I think that's really important, and I had no idea, frankly, that, that, that uh, the job entailed all of that. I think, you know, I, I'm not going to belabor the point too much more. I think this bears more discussion in the future. Because if I were watching this at home, I wouldn't be convinced. And, and I think it's probably the responsibility of the department to help. I see you shaking your head. I mean, I'm not talking about from my point of view. I, don't, I, don't, I know... Not everyone here would care what my point of view is. I'm just saying, objectively speaking, I think it would be difficult to watch this proceeding and understand that all of this without in-office accountability is worth the 35000 I mean, I'm sorry. I'm talking about your salary. I'm this is uncomfortable because I'm talking to you about your salary, and I'm saying it may be easy to watch this and not understand. I'm pointing the camera at home why it adds up. And you may feel in your heart or, or your department may feel that this is totally re reasonable, but I, I don't know that that's obvious from the outside. I mean, it's not my final point, but I, maybe we should do more to, to, to uh, celebrate all that you do, to be honest, and it could be a win-win. You get more, more exposure for the good work you do, and at the same time, people can understand. But I, you know, I, I read a letter like this one with, with interest, not at the ad hominem, but at the actual dollars and cents, and it he still doesn't add up for me. I, I think if I can just interject for a quick, I mean, I think part of the, probably part of the challenge is that, you know, a lot of what the election commissioners do is not, I mean, we see you at election time, right? And, and the rest of the year, you know, you're doing other things that isn't, that aren't as visible, you know, in the community. So it's, e you know, it's easy to, to see that, you know, we're here every Monday, right? And we're at all these meetings and people see us out and about and people still question the salary that we make, right? And, um, well, you know, but but I think there are some jobs that um, are less visible and there are some jobs that the, I mean, would, you know, I don't know if, if each election commissioner does 20 hours a week every week, but I know that there's probably some weeks where they do 80, you know, and so there are some positions and some jobs in any any profession where there are much busier times where people work 
a lot more, and there are times when things are maybe a little bit slower, and maybe you know they work a, you know a little less. So I don't know if that's part of it, but my guess is that you have busy seasons where you're doing a lot more than 20 hours a week, and you probably have some seasons that sometimes where there's a little bit more of a lull. So um, it's a, it's a little it's a it's a much tougher to make the case to the public and, and from the outside. It, it's it's a little bit more challenging because a lot of what you do isn't as as visible except for certain times of the year. Mr. Manager. Maybe I could make a suggestion because obviously I think we all should be able to know what we do and announce the time we put in, but I don't think in my list of preparations with telling you that this was one of the questions that we were preparing for, and not that we should know, to, but maybe it would be helpful is before this is over, you give us a little time and we can put something together that better illustrates, I think, what you're looking for. Because I think we can do a better job explaining what goes in this if we just have a chance to step back. And, and I would be happy to work with them to kind of that, do that. that. Appreciate that. Great. Just on your behalf, I, I think one of the strongest ways uh, to, to show uh, a fiscal motive for this would, would maybe to be to say, here's a, another city of a similar, similar population, and obviously the number of of voting locations will probably be correlated to population size. And here's how we save money by having these election commissioners doing real work and doing real HR services and doing real outreach. And look at this other city that's paying, you know, $200,000 more on the whole. And, and, and if we can say that we're saving money or if we can say that, I don't know, if we, if, <laughs> You don't just have to make a case about how hard people are working, but also the value that they present, which is apparently quite high. You know, there's a lot of ways we could justify this. Okay, so my final point, which is kind of about the committee meetings we had last year, which is maybe where you spent more time prepping. Um, you know, we're in a city. You're 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 boasting some really great numbers here in the uh, catalog. Uh, Seventy-three thousand five hundred individuals registered to vote in Cambridge. Obviously, the turnout uh, very low. Uh, this is also a, a, a correlated. Um, around uh, uh, socioeconomic status. Uh, there's also uh, race and distance correlations. There's all kinds of things we see all over America that are also true here. Um, I, I haven't finished running my numbers on uh, ethnicity breakdown of uh, people more likely to vote, but the early numbers are looking pretty uh, not great for equity and equitable participation. So some of these committee meetings were um, oriented around the election commission um, maintaining a nonpartisan, non-political uh, interest in increasing turnout. And I think that's something that's in process or in awaiting reports or something. Do we, do we know how the election commission seeks to increase the equity of participation and uh, outreach as a matter of especially odd year, but also all election participation? I'm sorry. It has to be a multi-phase question. We don't necessarily know um, the race and ethnicity of the people who are registering and showing up to vote. It's, it's not a question that's asked on the form, and it's not a, something that we keep track of, and I don't know whether there's any real way to keep track of that. Um, we try to make uh, people aware that elections are happening and there are postings all over the city and in every city library, et cetera. Um, we, um, most of the commissioners at some point it, do uh, informational sessions with small community groups or larger community groups. My, my favorite is always with, uh, not with a group of voters, but with a group of uh, future voters when we speak to the people that are doing their citizenship training for uh, naturalization. Um, but turnout is, is uh, our job is to make sure that people know elections are happening and that here's where you go for those elections and uh, here are the hours, et cetera. That's, 
that's our job. Turnout is a more complicated thing. In the presidential election, there's no problem with turnout. Large numbers of people turn out. And they turn out because there's heavy-duty advertising that's going on from the candidates, from the political parties, from the special interest groups. Um, in a state election, a similar kind of thing happens, although it's a little bit lower key. Um, I don't think Massachusetts voters react particularly when they see an ad on local television for somebody running for Senate in New Hampshire as they would for somebody running for Senate in Massachusetts. Um, but special interest groups are responsible for a lot of the turnout and a lot of the interest. That's a political question that, um, that we can't be part of, nor do we want to be. And we can't be part of uh, providing information about candidates or local issues at all because those are political questions beyond, way beyond our purview. And that's what turns people out to vote. Uh, it's however many signs we put up in the city, uh, however many precincts we indicate by putting the sandwich signs out, however much we do something like that, beyond advertising that there's an election coming up, most of the issues we can't speak to and that's the job of the people who are running for the offices that are open and for those special interest groups who have a care about which person gets elected. And we can't participate in any way on any of those issues. Well, yeah, we've had that conversation before, and I think we might be confusing two separate issues. I'm talking about our election system, which is wonderful, um, being one in which candidates are establishing a base, and that base is only a fraction of the overall electorate, and where nine candidates don't have tight districts in which to mobilize the maximum number of votes, but can in fact pull from any walk of life all over the city, it's very likely that they'll pull from a base that they align with. That, that means that if we don't have a fully representative or equitable council on a socioeconomic basis, on racial basis, on religious basis, on whatever basis you want, it will continue to be so because of how people reach their base and which bases are likely to be reached. I'm just saying that there is a bias that will continue to go forward if we don't do better engagement, and it doesn't have to be political engagement. We are welcome as a city to post more signs or to do more community meetings just to talk about the existence so of voting. If we can, are you asking for a, a budget allocation to do that? Yes. Yes, I'm asking for a substantial budget allocation to improve the diversity of turnout, which should be a very basic goal of a city that believes in equity. Sorry, I'm, I don't quite understand it because that, that to me, is political. How is that political? So Not let's, doing let's, anything. How, we, we, we're gonna, let's, how do we let's focus move on any one particular group? No, no, you don't. You do it citywide with the understanding. You do it citywide. So, you can't choose, pick and choose the group. The point is that certain folks are already represented and participating at a high level, and other folks aren't because they're reached less. They're passing fewer election commission signs in front of a polling location. They're, so, so Councilor Meisner, if I may, I, I think the question is, if there were uh, additional funds in the election commission, how could we better reach out to groups that are underrepresented in the, in the city to increase, to try and increase turnout? How do we reach out, my, just to clarify, because I think that's actually the matter at hand, how do we reach out to all groups equally? How do we reach out to the whole city without bias so that those who have been getting very little outreach get the same amount of outreach as those who have been getting a lot of outreach. There's people who watch TV more. There's people who engage with candidates more. People who walk by uh, downtown or city hall more. And then there's people who are socialized to, to vote more in their own uh, communities. And all of these things are things where we can rise above the background noise and have a presence in, in all people's lives as and, they as they look forward to participating. And I don't know if that's, you know, something you can maybe think about more and get, and, and get back to us. I think, you know, the, the question is, um, you know, I think as, as 
Ms. Cobb said, I think, I think turnout's a funny thing, especially in municipal elections and why we see such a low turnout. I, I, I don't know how much of it is, you know, that the election commission could or should be doing more or how much of it is the city is run very well. You know, I think you tend to see more people get involved in all kinds of things when they're unhappy, right? And, you know, you have a city that for the most part, our, our approval numbers in our city survey are really high. I think you have councilors who run, who are, you know, unlike the, you know, the, the days of the, of rent control or no rent control, you have councilors who run that, um, you know, that you don't, you don't see too many councilors who are running legitimate campaigns get up and say, you know, early childhood education is not important or affordable housing is not important. So I think there's some, if you talk to some voters, it's kind of, well, everybody's kind of saying the same. I think there's a lot of reasons that go into low turnout in municipal elections that are different or separate from the election commission. I, I do think, though, in, in one of the things that I wanted to follow up, Councilor Mazin, is, um, you know, is about, you know, what can we do around, I, I mean, this sort of in general, it was the, the, the 16, when Consulate Devereaux mentioned the 16-year-olds can register early, you know, what can we do to, instead of saying, you know, they have to come to the office and do that, and this is obviously last year, you had a presidential election, so that's a whole different ballgame. But moving forward, um, if we, if the, the only 16-year-olds who are going to walk to the election commission and register to vote will be like my kid. Who I say you need to go do this, or you know, who grows up, grew up in a political family. So how do we, um, you know, how, what are we doing at the high school to register kids? What are we doing to, you know, are we in? Or do we go to every public housing development in the city, you know, to say to do voter registration drives? I don't know if that's if that's even you or that's or that's somebody else, but it all gets kind of mushed together. Um, you know, those are the kinds of things I think that that people are curious about is, you know, what are we doing in the, you know, the, the downtime, you know, when it's not around an election to try and register more people and we have, or, or turn more people out. And obviously we have 73,000 people registered. That's a huge number. That's a huge increase, right? I mean, that's, um, so something's working, you know. Um, but I think, and, and, and to Councilor Maz's point, I think there's a difference between, um, I think we have to do, it's, it's not so much an equity uh, or an, an equality issue as an equity issue of, we, there may be certain neighborhoods where we have to do more than what we do in other neighborhoods, right? So it's not that everybody gets the same amount of outreach. You might have to, we might actually have to actually try and promote the elections more in, in certain neighborhoods where voter turnout is really low. And I don't know, maybe maybe that crosses a line. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, but can I, can I return to my comments? Uh, um, I, I, I want to keep them... I can keep them brief. I want to keep I them brief, and I want to keep speaking. them now. I, I've, 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 I, think, I think I, I want to continue speaking. I, I, I think I will. I'd like to speak. I, 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 I will do that. I think I'm giving a lot of leeway, um, and and we've done that. We've done that with other departments. We've we've given leeway. So, you know, even when the questions are more difficult, um, it's important. If I'm going to give leeway when we're celebrating things, I want to give leeway when the questions are are more challenging. I think that's fair, um, but I do want to try to. Hone this in, Councillor Mazin, if you can. And I think, as the manager said, that, that there's, uh, uh, and this goes to the importance of getting questions ahead of time so people can be ready and prepared. Um, and I know that's sometimes hard because things don't come up. You don't think about something until it's in front of you. Um, but if we can sort of keep to the budget and move this conversation forward, I think we've kind of, and, and we need to have another conversation in another setting about um, the questions that you have. Let, let, me, um, let me finish up then. I have uh, two bullet points here. Uh, one is I appreciate your reframe. You're saying sometimes people don't participate because the, the quality of, of uh, enjoyment in the city and satisfaction is very high. I think, unfortunately, that comes very dangerous to insinuating that the disproportionately low turnout in immigrant, minority, and low socioeconomic status communities is somehow because voters are exceptionally happy with with uh, their, their kind of dwindling economic uh, uh, power. Well, I, okay, well, I'm just saying let's not reframe it using that as the primary factor. I appreciate your follow-up point, which is my second point, which is that we, we may need to achieve equity, and I, I wish we could do it in such a way that we were able to bring everyone to parity by reaching out disproportionately to different neighborhoods, but I, I think we've gathered over time 
that that's not something we're allowed to do. What I'm suggesting is that we have the same but very high level outreach in every neighborhood that whatever work the candidates are doing uh, is important but, but a little bit um, you know, arbitrary from the perspective of complete coverage. And that, you know, while, while candidates may do their political thing, we really need to have a high threshold for what it means to reach and engage communities um, meaningfully. And, and so I, I guess I just don't want to wade into a territory where we're told it's not legal because it's not equal. Right. Well, I, I, think, I think we should, ha again, I think we should have that conversation if we want to have a government ops conversation about it. Um, you know, we, we, we can do that and we can plan an agenda and, and give the election commission, you know, the questions ahead of time so that they can and be, be fully prepared. Point, and to be clear on that point, I, I mean, these are questions I've raised in committee and we had some very standoffish committee meetings because <clears throat> people don't necessarily <clears throat> want uh, on the election commission side, it appears, to, to actually engage these questions that well, I've asked. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. And I, I don't want to get into engaging. that. I, I don't want to. I don't want to get into personalities and get and, and get into that. So um, I don't think anyone's debating that there were difficult meetings. Difficult meetings are fine, but let's let's you know. Okay. So I'm let's not let's not assume we know other people's had, motives. No, I'm not talking about the motives. I'm just saying they've had the questions for a long time. These are questions we raised in committee. I'm sure they prepped with the city manager on exactly this topic because we've raised it in two or three separate committee meetings. I don't think this is a, like a, a crazily blindsiding anyone here. These are the same questions we've been ra raising for three years. Do we have a sense, um, Ms. Peterson, of where that awaiting report is uh, that, that Councillor Mazin referenced in terms of getting some of those questions answered? I think it, you mentioned that I don't have the awaiting report list in front of me. But is, there was is this, uh, excuse me, this is about putting together the voter, the voter manual that in, included in that um, the can information on candidates and everything. And I think you've received the answer a couple of times where the election commission is not going to be giving out information on candidates. However, we can, and I mean, and that is often the role of other civic groups to sort of do that or, or um, um, uh, newspapers, et cetera. Um, you know, I think what we can do and what we will always sort of look at is, um, you know, are there better ways that we need to be getting information out to really make sure that people really understand how to vote, how to register, how to be engaged? I think a very... Um, positive example of that was what the election commission did with voter um, early voting and there were some very good um, communications materials that went out and I think it was a very successful effort in terms of early voting. Um, I think that we can look at over the years there's been different publications about different things and I think that we can uh, listen to what you're saying and if we need to get back before the budget we can do that but about um, you know, if there's additional materials we want to be putting out about how to vote, how to vote PR, how to make sure that we're doing that. Um, I mean, I know that you have this information, but make sure that we're, um, you know, putting that out equally into all, all neighborhoods, making sure that we're able to go and coordinate with CRLS and what kind of resources we would need if we need additional ones in order to do that. So we'd like the opportunity to be able to talk to the Election Commission a little bit more about that, and then uh, we can get back to the Council. Thank you. And the, the, the final detail, which I hope is, well, hopefully somewhat less controversial, is that voters receive um, a notice about their tax uh, rate in very close proximity to the election. And I think uh, if we're going to be upset with FBI uh, Director Comey for influencing elections based on positive or negative perceptions, we should be very careful about telling people these are outrageously good tax rates and here's the council that delivered these tax rates in such close proximity to elections. So if we could wait until, I, I know it's like a matter of timing and not a matter of, of malevolence, but if we could just hold, people will still be grateful for the information, but if we could just hold that until after elections, I know that's more for the city manager's office, but I really wanted to make that clear as part of this because I think it's an important election uh, commitment. So I, I believe the information goes out right after the tax rate is set, right. which is in September. So there is a scheduling uh, issue here that I think would be difficult to wait until mid-November because tax bills are going out in October, right? Right. And, and, and again, I, I would just say, you know, uh, well, we have to be careful about assuming that there's some 
you know, conscious decision going on about how do we manipulate things. I think no, I'm not contrary. Different. I'm saying it's happenstance, but it's not a good look, and it's not really fair okay. to, to non-incumbents. Right. So Jim. we do that at a different time. Councilor Tim. Thank you. At, on the last point that was just raised, I believe it's statutorily set, and when those tax bills go out, the residents, like seniors, have only a certain amount of time to apply for abatements and things of that nature. So if that information is not sent out, they could possibly be, be penalized by not getting that information to file for an abatement and for different uh, benefits as people each year get older, then they're eligible for different uh, abatements on their tax bill. So I, I just don't see how you, unless we change the date of the elections or by state law in Cambridge, just change the when the tax bills go out, how you avoid that conflict, but that's my point on that. But uh, it, this whole issue is really a multifaceted um, process here in terms of uh, what we're talking about. And um, I, I would say I, there's probably no other community that's more easy to register to vote and gain access to information than, than Cambridge. Um, any big events, the election commissioners are there, or volunteers for voter registration. They're at the high school, and, you know, I, probably at the high school, I'm not sure we even teach civics anymore, so there's probably no class for the kids to understand elections and civics, and which is an issue that should be addressed by the, by the school committee and the superintendent. Um, so that kids are more attuned and know. I mean, at 16, they can, you know, if they're going to be 18 by the next birthday, they can pre-register. You talk about early voting. The seat of Cambridge allowed early voting before it probably even was legal because people could go in once the ballots were in and say that, you know, they're going to be out of town. There was never an issue of that. There was a lot of access uh, to allow that to happen. Um, I, it's... You know, 73,000 registered voters um, that are there. And it's a full-time job, I think, for the election commissions and the staff. And they're accessible and at, at all times. And I, I think they do an outstanding job. Um, the mayor talked about um, what points that I was going to bring up about is that no people, you know, the, the national state, I mean, I think the national election would be probably about close to 90% turnout. Of, of voters, so, and that reached across every ethnic and group, I would say, in the city. It was a close to 90% turnout. The municipal certainly is, is much lower than that. Is that a reflection on the candidates, that people just don't want to come out? Maybe we should have none of the, none of the above added to the, to the, to the ballot, would be, might be helpful. But I think attribute that a lot of that, as the mayor said, Things are going very well in the city right now with the services and the, the uh, low tax rate. And so people tend not to get as involved. But it's about, that's up to the candidates, not to the election commissioners to go out to get people to, to register and to vote. That's up to whoever is running for office at that time. That is their response. That's their job is to get people. And some people do it and some people don't. I mean, we all have different ways of campaigning, but... You know, it, it is what it is, and that, that's our responsibility. And I think if you look at the history of the city, and I think you could see the decline in voting when it came to the end of rent control. When we had rent control, the numbers were astronomical. There would be 30, 35,000 people easily voting, and that's because people had a vested interest. You had the pro-rent control people and the anti-rent control people, and they organized very well among the groups to make sure that their voters get out to vote. So I think you probably, if you look at the history of the decline in voting, you probably would see that's when that decline started because now people, you know, wasn't as and the issue. And that was that was the defining issue. I mean, you were either for or against. No matter what other position you held, that's how you were defined. And I think that's when we saw the de decline. So I think with the city being run so well and, and um, professional and the level of services that people are quite, quite happy. And probably at this point in the next couple of years when all of a sudden people who are now paying twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars a year in taxes are going to see this go to 50000 that might motivate them to, to get involved. But because, and that's a possibility to happen when you look at the assessments in the city now, that those tax bills are going to dramatically increase 
at the level of spending, which is good that we're doing, but that's going to come at a cost at some point. There's no question about that. So, again, I'll just end it at that, but I, I think the election commission has always been nonpartisan and nonpolitical, and it has to stay that way. Um, and, you know, it's up to, you know, individual citizens to organize uh, voter registrations. I believe we're hiring a uh, new director of immigration services that probably could help in that in coordinating with the different um, immigrant agencies throughout the city to get those agencies more involved. But there's um, many, many ways that we have made voting and voter registration uh, easily accessible to all of our residents. And so I just wanted to point that out. That's my uh, personal opinion of the thing. And I um, just want to commend the director and the staff. And, uh, and you know, it's not an easy job in, in that office at times when you go down there and people, are, you know, if the name isn't on that, you know, because they didn't return the census or they hadn't voted in four years or ten years and come in and demand to be able to vote, and you have to tell them, no, you can't vote because you've not been on the books for ten years. So, and, that, and that happens quite frequently. So, um, a job well done, but I always say whoever the candidates are, that's their job. You have your job, and the candidates have their job. And that should remain sacrosanct, separate, completely separate. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilor Mark. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, and I, too, just want to, um, first of all, I want to thank um, Tanya and the commissioners. And I, I think that, that what sometimes happens is that when we tend to do a good job, we're always kind of looking at what we can do better. And, and I think that, that when we look at the way elections are run in the city of Cambridge, all we need to do is to turn on the local news or the national news and look at people waiting in line for three, four, five hours in communities around this country. That does not happen here. And the reason it doesn't happen is because of the efficiency in allowing people to vote in the neighborhoods where they live and to not have to travel very far to be able to have those 34 precincts and be able to still have a very reasonable approach to um, community here. And so, I, you know, I, I think that um, that doesn't mean at all that we can't look at things in way, better ways to engage folks. And I know that the commissioners are uh, committed to doing that, and I know that the commissioners have worked hard to, to do that. And I will just say, you know, to Councillor Toomey's point, that, you know, I think the first election that I ran in, I think there were 28,000 people voted, and we've seen that number go as low as 13,000 and now kind of ticked up a little bit. Um, and, and I do think that there are a number of different reasons for that. And I think that, that uh, you know, one, one is, and, and the vice mayor talked about it, is the, the fact that there are many people that believe that things are going pretty well and they may not be as engaged. I also think we have to look at the... Um, influx of new housing that has been uh, built in the city and the fact that many of the people living in those housing units are not as engaged, uh, the newer citizens to the community. And I think we all know that, that if you look on the eastern end and on the, uh, uh, the northwest side of the city, where many of the new housing units are, those are not necessarily the most engaged uh, citizens. And it, it is up to uh, uh, candidates to be able to help engage those newer residents. But I, I think that, um, you know, overall, I give high marks to the way we run elections in the city of Cambridge. And I know that the work, um, uh, the work that the commissioners do and the work that the staff at the election commission does is surely not even. And what I mean by that is some years there may be one election, and in other years we've had as many as I believe six elections in, in recent years. So it is very uneven, but I think that overall I think that we are doing an extraordinary job in, in uh, reaching people and in, in, in providing people with the opportunity to be able to cast their ballots in a very, very timely way and not expecting people, you know, the, the person who is making $15 an hour, 
um, who needs to be to work at 8 o'clock and shows up at a polling station at 7.30 in the morning does not have the luxury of sitting there and in, in standing in line for five or six hours. Um, and, and it's very, very uh, uncommon to see somebody waiting in any kind of a line in Cambridge. You may, may see it right at 7 o'clock, but it's, it's typically – not happening in this community. And I, and I think that that is a, uh, something that we should celebrate. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilman. Before I go back uh, to you, just a couple, I have a couple questions. And, um, you mentioned the census. I, I was actually, I was surprised to get this question the other day from someone who said, why it feels like I'm filling out a census like all the time. <laughs> How often do we send it out? Is there, is it a, State law that we have to do it. I mean, what he, he, he was talking about it bordering on harassment. I didn't quite go that, that far, but I, I didn't quite know what the, I assumed it had something to do. We were required to do it a certain amount of times, but I. Well, we do two mailings. Um, the second, the first and second notice, and then we do a third mailing confirmation card, which informs you that you have not responded and you will become inactive. We do that every year or? Every single year by state law. Okay. So people get, they get, They'll get one mailing a year if they fill it out, and then they two if they don't. Everyone gets we, – we send it out. We try to go through all of – we try to go through all um, – do the data entry for all of the census forms so that you don't get the second uh, notice, but there's no way. Sometimes we have twenty or 30,000 to complete within a month. Mm -hmm. before the second mailing goes out. So then a person will get a second notice. If they all they have to do is call the office, make sure we received it. Sometimes we don't receive it. Right. Their first notice completed. So if they have any question about it, they can call us. We can look it up and say we received it. No need to send a second one in. And we're required to do that every year? Every year. Okay. Um, I had a question about – we have – And excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner wanted me also to remind people that it's also online. So we, we do receive them online. Okay. Um, and then we have um, our 34 precincts. Um, do we ever have uh, – I'm thinking of all the construction that's happening at North Point and L Wife, and I know that, you know, there are some locations where polling places are like – I mean, you can almost hit one from the other with a tennis ball, um, but – there's somewhere there's a little bit more, you know, more distance. Um, so I'm thinking about the folks who, all the people that are moving into North Point would have to go to, are they the, the library? They got to cross over, they got to cross over the highway, you know, they have to cross over the highway, go, you know, into the neighborhood or at Alwife, they, they, they got to go to um, Tobin. Um, so how do we decide, I mean, no, no. Our, in, in Ward Nine, there's um, in Ward Nine in the Alewife area. Nine two votes at the Armory. At the Armory. Nine one votes at the fire station on Lexington Avenue, and nine three votes at the Haggerty. So, w do we think? I mean, where we're seeing this boom of construction and residential construction, do any thought given to doing something closer to them or in those buildings? Is that? Um, can we do that? Can siding, siding precincts is a very complicated, difficult thing to do. And uh, I, would, I would simply love it if we could put a precinct dead center of, uh, put a voting place dead center of every precinct. That would be lovely. It's, it's not something we are necessarily able to do, uh, in part because there are only so many public buildings in the city. And they tend to be clustered along main drags, which also tend to be where lines are drawn when, uh, when we're creating precincts. So it's a complicated sort of thing to do. Um, the most difficult thing, frankly, is the road work that's being done. Certainly in West Cambridge, uh, we had to make... Do we have any construction going on in West oh, Cambridge? Yeah, just a little. But we had to make absolutely sure that people could actually drive up to the armory when they were digging up Concord Avenue, that they could access Lexington from both Brattle and Huron. It's that kind of thing that uh, we have to be sure that we are interacting with the departments that are responsible for the, the road 
work, and in the case of the most recent road work, that's both the Water Department and the DPW because there are different issues going on with those things. So uh, the construction itself ought not to impinge when they're building a new building. Road work can impinge, and that's particularly critical for people with disabilities who need to be able to park close by. And um, Yeah, I just wanted to you know, make a the ADA requirements is a big part of this. There's been some in East that we had to move because they didn't comply with the ADA requirements. So that's a huge issue, too, so that you have to take into it. As you said, it's a very complicated siting process. Yeah, I'm just, I was just thinking in terms of, um, you know, when we were talking about different demographics that, that don't come out as much, and, and I'm thinking about municipal elections where a lot of it is on the candidates where, um, you know, if you look at people who vote in municipal elections, a lot of young people or people newer to the city, whether they're young or not, um, don't vote in, in municipal elections. Some of that is on us as candidates because are we reaching out to those people or not? Um, but it's also, you know, convenience. I mean, you know, I wish everybody got up right and early in the morning and did their civic duty and said, we're going to go and vote and I'm going to vote every, every election. But that doesn't really happen, and I think some of it is, you know, it's how much you're invested, right? And if you're newer to the city and, you know, you're not as invested yet in, in the community and you have to go several blocks over and cross a highway and deal with construction and deal with all that to vote, you might just say, eh, forget it. And so, you know, anything that we can do to kind of... It, when we think about who doesn't vote, we think, you know, often we go to race, socioeconomics, and, and whatnot. But it's also, it's people newer to the city don't vote as, as a higher percentage. So, in municipals anyway. So, um, I just, I was just wondering with all the clusters, I mean, you're talking about 3,000 plus people eventually in North Point, or, you know, however many it's going to be. Um, I mean, that's a whole, I mean, that's, that's, that's a whole district within itself, right? So, you know, anything that we can just, start tossing around and thinking about, um, you know, how do we make it easier for them because we want to bring those people in as well. Um, and then the other question I had, um, I think it's great around, uh, uh, Lisa mentioned this, um, around PR, you know, I'm, I'm always amazed, as I think we probably all are, that even people who have voted and live in the city for a really long time don't really understand how it works. Um, I think as much education we can, and, and it's a complicated system that even when you try to simplify it, even the simple explanation is complicated. So, you know, as much as we can do to, to continue to, to get that message out there, I, I always thought it would be helpful to have a, a myths of PR because people repeat this, you know, if I bullet vote, it counts more than anything else. Well, no, that's not true. You know, and, and something, some, something that people, we can address some of the concerns that we typically hear, and maybe we have to communicate that better to you. But, um, you know, it is, it's, it's, I mean, even people who have done it a bunch of times don't fully understand what they're doing. So we've got to make sure we're, we're explaining that better. Um, and then my last point in terms of outreach, um, I don't know if we do anything, if you guys do anything with the community engagement team, um, but that's a, a city, uh, a city group that goes out into um, communities that are not always well represented, they speak the language, they're from those communities, and they tell them about whether there are meetings at schools, whether there are certain things going on in the city, and that's what they do. And so it might be, if you're thinking about how do we reach out to some, some of these communities, they might be a great resource because they're trusted in the community, and they could go out around election time and say, hey, do you know there's a municipal election coming up or there's a presidential election? And that's, you know, that's kind of what they're there for. Um, Go to Councillor Devereaux and then come back since Councillor you, Councillor Devereaux. Oh, thank you. Just to, to follow on to that and our prior conversation about social media, um, I think it would be a great use of social media to have a video and other things that explain PR, um, you know, send out reminders of when deadlines to register, or how to register online, how to absentee ballots, all of the mechanics that are not at all political are simply logistical, mechanical. And I, I, if you have social media, I'm not sure I, I follow it, but I would. And I think that would be a way to reach a segment of voters who may not be paying attention um, to other channels. So just a suggestion. You don't need to respond unless you'd like to. Thank you. Councillor Mason. Yes, I was just going to suggest on my final point from before. Um, maybe one way to send out the notice on time and have it not uh, impact the election as much 
is to just remove the counselor's names from it and then say, you know, on behalf of the council rather than these people. Um, I'm just trying to, to, to uh, offer one last comment that might solve that problem in a non-controversial way. I believe, and I could be wrong, that these newsletters are from me and traditionally do not include, while well, the city manager, whoever it was, do not, it's the city manager's name, the deputy city manager's name, and the assistant city manager. Now, maybe not on all three, but uh, we can check that. But no, I, if that is the case, I think we could easily do that. I think I understand it because you are right. It comes probably a week or two before the election. That's, but that's because, you know, this is going way back when Brian Murphy was the finance chair. We really felt we need to do a better job explaining what, how we come about with tax bills and, you know, when it, I got to say, it's a lot of work for the finance team because these are three pretty informative documents that are really done in about a five-week period. And the first one is to let people know, you know a little about our budget and where we're going. But I think the most important one is the second one, the times to the election. And the goal has always been that before someone gets their bill, we kind of explain what's going on. Now, the good news is that that's been good news. However, we would not change because we'd still send it out before they got the bill if it was bad news. So, but you are right because, you know, tax bills traditionally go out October 1st to November 1st. We end up being more in the middle. So our bills usually go out about October 15th, October 18th, which pushes it that they do November 18th, that it gets closer and closer to the election when the time the bills go out. But I do think it's important that we get that second newsletter out before the tax bill. But certainly I would not be opposed if there are counselors' names in that to take a look at that. But I didn't think there were, but I can check that. I'm not sure either. I guess we'll find out after. But thank you. And, and I think it's, you know, I'll, I'll just say this last point. I, I know Councilor Mazza will want to respond to it. But, um, you know, I also think, you know, people see what they want to see, right? And, and, and so some people will look at getting their tax bill and before an election and be grateful that they got a tax or they got the notice before they got their tax bill because it gave them information. Some people will look at it and see that there's a, you know, conspiracy to help the incumbent candidates. I, I don't know what to do about that because people, we've done things where we've tried to change meeting, you know, people complain that need too many meetings in the afternoon, so we have them at night. Well, then a new group of people complain. I mean, it's just, you know, you can run your, you'd be chasing your tail forever. And, and to me, it's much more important of do you trust that the motivations are good? And I think, Mr. Manager, I certainly trust that they are. And like you said, um, you know, if in, the, if, if in the bad years, if there was a year where we raised the tax rate and you didn't send them out at that time, I would say, gee, why didn't you do that? Um, we haven't had that that incident, but I think at the end of the day, there you know, um, you know, there are folks that see conspiracies around every corner. There are folks that don't pay attention, um, and you know, you do the best that you can do. But I think it makes sense that someone would want an explanation as to what their t how the, their taxes are being decided or determined before they get a bill that might be an increase or, or something else. So it's just complicated stuff. But all right, so we are. You, okay, so on a motion by Councilor Marr to move the Election Commission budget to the full City Council with a favorable recommendation. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And it is referred with a favorable recommendation. Thank you very much. Um, all those in favor say aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Uh, just a little quick housekeeping um, on the Election Commission budget. I, I uh, asked for a vo voice vote. Um, I did not hear Councillor Mazin in the negative, so if we can record that uh, Councillor Mazin was in the negative on referring the Election Commission budget to the full City Council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you.